not want to live a powerless life life without identity kingdom of darkness does not acknowledge that i have come and i live under the yoke of the devil i don't want to live i don't want to live under the subjugation of the kingdom of darkness i believe in power i'm a creature of power i was forged by power i was created for power i have been given power if it will ever be turn your Bible to the book of Ezekiel chapter 22 as we find the coordinates for this conference. We'll begin our reading from verse number 24. Okay, let's start from 23. And the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, Say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, not rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls, they have taken the treasure and the precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. In this unveiling of disalignment, in verse 26, the portion of the disalignment that was attributed to the priest was outlined. Verse 26. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. And I am profaned among them. A long list of violations were itemized from the perspective of heaven. The other items that do not have to do with ministers of the gospel, priests, may not be highlighted during the course of this brief presentation. But my emphasis is the perspective of disalignment that was attributed to the priest office. A few things were mentioned. However, the issue that is of concern to me that I believe the Holy Ghost took his time to highlight upon my spirit man is the issue of the fact that the priest did not do due diligence to unveil the difference, the dichotomy between the clean and the unclean. The priest did not do the due diligence to show the difference between that which is holy and that which is profane. Are you with me? The priest did not unveil what is sacred and what is common. That was part of the issues that God raised about the disalignment of the ministers of the gospel in that time. And in summary, God revealed that the land of Israel was like a territory that is not cleansed. At the heart of the fabric of that assessment is the labor of the priesthood that was not conducted according to pattern. 
I was watching something on Facebook not too long ago, and I found in a certain convention like this, some comedians came, they had a part in the program. And they were on the pulpit, and all kinds of blasphemy and abomination was part of what they came to present in a hallowed conference. Now, if someone happens to be a new convert in that kind of arrangement, he might think that our God uh, is an entertainer. As humorous as Jesus was, he never cracked a joke throughout his ministry. Because if Jesus should say, your head big, oh, your head will become big. Because the Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. You see, you are not with me. I'm not saying, because what you heard or what you think I said is that God is so modest. And because of his modesty, he does not involve himself in things like lying. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying God operates in an energy level such that if he says a thing, it will become true. God cannot lie. It is because the way God uses words is different from the way we do use words. And that's why you find that Jesus never cracked a joke. It is the ministry of the priest to bring about a differentiation between that which is clean and that which is unclean. As we journey today, my little quarter in the minister's conference is to bring about what I call a quality control instrument with which we will view our labors and find out if we are in the service of God. May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus. Whenever petroleum products are brought into this nation, the first thing that happens after the port health functionaries screen the crew members on the vessels to ascertain their current health status is that the product, the cargo that was brought in is a portion of it is sent to the lab. And the reason for that is we need to ascertain the quality of the product that is coming to our nation. How many of you remember? Okay, most of us were not, we didn't have cars then. There was one time when an off-spec petrol was imported into Nigeria and it had an order. Meanwhile, because of uh, several things that happened behind the table, it was cleared for dispatch. And most of the vehicles then that were maybe second-hand vehicles or third-hand vehicles, felt the scourge of a little variation in the spec. Now, that petrol brought damage to vehicles instead of providing fuel for their motion. And if there is a distortion of the quality of what we are delivering as ministry, it can cause harm to the development of a man that is seeking to apprehend Jesus, apprehend the Christ in his mission or his pilgrimage upon the face of the earth. And so it's needful for us to do some form of quality control in order for us to ascertain whether what we are delivering as ministry is consistent with the standard. Come with me quickly. I want to show you two scriptures 
that unveil two irreconcilable civilizations domiciled in the realm of the spirit. In the book of Revelation, chapter 17, verse 1 to 5. Technical people, can you help me? Do something. Can you get my scripture on the screen so that I will not be trying to figure out? Revelation, chapter 17. Beginning from verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that seated upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. This is one civilization. And John had to be carried in the spirit in order for him to see the texture of this civilization. This is not something that you can stumble upon just because you attend a lecture in the university. It is not something of, that you can stumble upon because you access a library. This was facilitated by a divinely granted visitation and all kinds of spiritual education was unveiled on the strength of the entrance that John had into this subject matter. It was a civilization. Second scripture. Revelation, chapter 21, verse 10. Quickly. So that we can set the compass. Revelation, chapter 21, Verse 10, and I saw, okay, oh my, verse 10, verse 10, so that we will not um, take so much time. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a, a, a wall great and high, and had 12 gates, and at the, at the gates 12 angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes, of the children of Israel. The reading continues, but because of time, I'm going to have to stop. Two irreconcilable civilizations were captured in the revelations that were brought to John. But if we do a contrast and a comparison, you will find out that in order for John, even though he was carried in the spirit to see the halot, he had to be carried in the spirit to a high mountain to see the city that was descending from heaven. So even in, this, in, in, in the spirit realm, there are planes, there are elevations, there are undulating geographical terrains in that realm. He had to be taken to a high mountain in the spirit to look upon that which was descending 
from heaven. And these are two separate civilizations. And John had to be carried to be aided by the Holy Ghost in order for him to decipher their texture. Are you with me? All right, let's do an intellectual contrast and comparison before we begin our navigation. First of all, so we have Babylon on one side, we have the new Jerusalem on the other side. Are you with me? Or you are not with me? Now, <laughs> do you remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. That's not all. Jesus said, you are a city that is set upon an hill that cannot be healed. This city that we call the New Jerusalem is actually the corporate expression of the body of Christ in its matured state. Worthy enough to be presented to her husband, even Christ Jesus. I'm talking about the church without spot, without wrinkle. This is the visage of that organic reality that is descending from heaven. That's what God has been working on all this while. And now the standard is in conformity with the, um, with the, 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 the level, the mark of heaven. And now it is in that glorious state that the head of the church can identify with, it is in that glorious state such that the fullest scope of the authority of God can be manifested within her on him that. That's the vision that God gave Apostle John. Are you still with me? Stay with me. All right. So if we do a contrast and a comparison, you are going to find that Babylon on one end is a halot. Now, a halot... Uh, Hallelujah. And then the new Jerusalem on the other end is a bride. Babylon on one end is called the great city with emphasis on great. The new Jerusalem happens to be a holy city with emphasis on holy. Babylon is common. It's available in the market. If you move to Benue State University, you'll find Babylon there. It's, even in your village, Babylon is common. You don't need to seek Babylon. It will, it's where you are. But this holy city is sacred. It is uncommon. You will need to seek it. If you will enter into it, if you will become it, you need to seek it. You know, the Bible says we, we ought to seek first the kingdom of God. Meanwhile, the same kingdom entered into us the day we gave our lives to Christ. But that which is contained in the spiritual capital that is domiciled in us will never find expression if we are not committed to seeking an entrance into the, the realities that are contained therein. So this city, the holy Jerusalem, is not common. And if you are not willing to seek, you will not find the realities that are concealed therein. Number four, when John was taken in the spirit, he saw Babylon in the wilderness. Hallelujah. Notice, you are not with me. Where did they see Babylon? In the wilderness. But this city was coming down from heaven. I'm just trying to give us metaphors that will help us understand the quality of what we are delivering. Because you are either ministering from Babylon or you are ministering from the holy city. But as we move on, you will find out 
all the parts of these civilizations. And then your eyes will be open to know where you stand. Now, you must run quality control tests regularly on your ministry. If not, a time will come where because of lack of, 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 of discernment, you might be bowing down to a God that Apostle Paul cannot recognize. And may the Lord help us in the name of Jesus. This, this city, Babylon, was in the wilderness. But this one was coming down from heaven. And when John was taken in the spirit, he, he didn't need to stand on any height in the spirit to see Babylon. But when John was taken in the spirit to see the new Jerusalem, he had to be pedestaled on a high mountain. Are you still with me? Just contrast and comparison. Now, we want to begin. These two cities actually find expression in the Garden of Eden. There are two trees in the Garden of Eden that are reflective of dimensions in the spirit realm. So when the Bible says, for instance, that spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, you need to understand that in heavenly places is not only divine things that are there. There are also wicked things in heavenly places. But in the divine realm, there is a culture. There are principles. There are laws that are indications of the fact that you are operating from the divine realm. These two realms are in heavenly places. But we will attempt by analyzing those two trees in the Garden of Eden to unveil those two dimensions. When God set out to create man, the intention of God was that man will be involved in the last lap of his development. And so the last lap of his development was anchored upon civilizations that were trapped in two trees. One of the trees happens to be the tree of life. And Adam was not prohibited from gaining access to that tree. Another tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there was an instruction from God that he wasn't supposed to have dealings with that tree because the entry point into a different kind of civilization. In fact, when Satan came to convince Adam, convince Eve that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the best prescription for him because God had an opportunity to instruct Adam on the choice that he should make. And the devil also, in Genesis chapter 3, had an opportunity to instruct Adam on the choice that he should make. And unfortunately, Adam chose the devil's option. It means that his lines of development has been determined. And those lines of development that God wanted him to be involved in, he made a choice that shut him out from the layer of life. You know, it is convenient to call the other tree the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. It was supposed to be called the tree of death. Because when we talk ministry, we need to discover what we are ministering. It is either life or death. And you can be ministering death for 21 years and not even know. And you are very busy and active. And you are breaking down because you are so active and you need drugs to sustain you. But what you are manufacturing, what you are producing is from a plane, a civilization that is weak in terms of substance. And the substance I speak about is life. It doesn't have the capacity to produce life. The product that it has is death. Are you with me? All right. When the devil came to convince Adam 
on the choice to make in terms of what to eat. His argument was that God is aware. God doth know that in the day that you eat of this food, you will become wise like God. Hallelujah. So Adam felt that, oh, is it that God is hiding a dimension of knowledge from me? You see, there was a lust for a dimension of knowledge. Meanwhile, God doesn't want us to have knowledge about the things of death experientially. Because if we are saying that we are going to eat the fruit, it means that we are going to have experiential knowledge. It's going to be digested. It's going to be assimilated. And the strength that comes from that food is going to drive us around. So what we are talking about here is experiential knowledge. And God doesn't want to have us to have experience of death because that is not within the construct of his frame of reference. He is a God of life. The Bible says with him is the fountain of life and in his light we see light. In fact, in the New Testament when Paul was trying to bring perspective, he said we are able ministers of the new covenant. We are not ministers of the old. We are the ministers of the new. And the hallmark of that which is new, according to Paul's argument, was that it had capacity to give life. For the letter kill it. And what? Oh, my God. So the proof of the fact that you are transmitting from the God zone is that what you have, the merchandise that you are giving out, is actually life. And if it is short of life... You are transmitting from Babylon. And as vast and great as Babylon is, it doesn't have the capacity to minister life. Are you here? So we are not talking about good versus evil. We are not talking about right versus wrong. We are talking about life versus death. May you not be found doing ministry because it is good. Is a good thing to do. For some others, God will put the burden of some nations. Slavery, Rwanda, Uganda. But there is an assignment for everyone. It doesn't matter where you walk, that's your walk, that's your job. But your calling is your walk.